Mr. Spider Boy. Spider Man. <laughs> you serious? Outside of comic books, superhero material is really hard to perfect. You should be able to tell just by the vast number of critical and or commercial flops that this genre has produced over the years. Often I find myself taking the MCU for granted, because while I have a laundry list of issues with these movies, they've still found a way to make stories about people that wear underwear on the outside not only entertaining, but compelling to a mainstream audience, which is a feat only a few before them have been able to do. Before the MCU, how many superheroes do you think your mom or dad could name? Or better yet, how many could your grandparents name? Probably only the big ones. Spider-Man, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman. Before the release of Civil War, most of the population didn't know who Ant-Man was, much less care about him. It is insanely difficult to get mainstream audiences to care about superheroes, but the MCU has done it consistently. But while I've felt a connection to almost all of these characters, something has felt off about Spider-Man. I have always preferred Sam Raimi's interpretation of Spider-Man, and it hasn't ever really been close. While I will acknowledge this is a more physically accurate Spider-Man, Tom Holland is short, he looks young, he has web shooters, and even his eyes move like they do in the comics. But this Spider-Man is not truly meant to be Spider-Man. He's meant to be another character that fits into the MCU, which just happens to be Spider-Man. To explain what I mean, let's go back to the 90s. This is the animated Spider-Man TV show. It's not the first or the best, but it is the one I remember the most from my childhood. And it actually perfectly represents what I'm trying to explain. I'll admit, the show is a bit silly and corny at times. I'll chase you to the ends of the earth! But it does a great job of making its world feel populated without feeling claustrophobic. Throughout the show, we meet characters like Doctor Strange, Iron Man, and the X-Men. But this is only the case when the scale goes a bit above and beyond Spider-Man's reach. This succeeds in making the world feel like there's more than just Spider-Man in it. But for most of the episodes, it's just Spider-Man and his villains. Green Goblin, Doc Ock, Hobgoblin, Venom, Carnage. Spider-Man's villains are some of the best in the business, so the stories are often self-contained. This world and this show feels like they were designed for Spider-Man, while this Spider-Man feels like he was dropped into a world designed for the Avengers and Iron Man. It seems like Disney and Marvel had an opportunity to add Spider-Man to their collection of characters, and Spider-Man is so unbelievably popular that they jumped on that opportunity and just added him to the next movie. And while they succeeded in making another MCU character, I'm not sure if they succeeded in making Spider-Man. The reason Spider-Man is so popular is because of his relatability. He's an everyman. Because he was shy, he wasn't that successful with girls, he had to worry about his family. Most teenagers reading it thought to themselves, hey, that could be me. Peter Parker is a normal kid with normal problems, until one day he gets bitten by a radioactive spider. He wasn't chosen by a god, he didn't take a super serum, it was just random chance. It could have happened to anyone. And even after he's given all this power, his life still isn't perfect. He still has normal problems, problems that most of us can relate to. Spider-Man has money problems, he's poor, he gets heartbroken, he's selfish at times, he makes mistakes. Sometimes people die and there's nothing he can do about it. These are things many of us can relate to, I know I can. But something I can't relate to is having everything given to me just like the MCU Spider-Man does. Spider-Man uses his intelligence to make his equipment. He designed his suit from scratch, but not this Spider-Man. This Spider-Man has things handed to him, a suit, another suit, and this strips a key element away from this character, the relatability. I'd like for us to take a look at a scene from The Amazing Spider-Man. Hey, it's all right. Ah, hey, look. Just a normal guy, right? Jack? Yes? Let's get you out of here. Put it on! The mask! It's gonna make you strong! Jack, trust me! This is Spider-Man. This movie and its sequel might not be remembered for the best reasons, but this scene is the definition of what Spider-Man should be. Let's take a look at a different scene, this time from Spider-Man 2, one of the best superhero films ever made. <laughs> Here is another 
great example of what these two movies understand and of what these two don't. These are both titular scenes in their respective movies. In this scene, this is when Peter finally decides to stop using his powers for selfish reasons and start saving people, becoming the Spider-Man that we all know. In this scene, Peter has finally gotten his powers back and is going after Doc Ock and is faced with one of his biggest physical challenges as Spider-Man, stopping a moving train. However, that's just what's happening on the surface. There's something that's much more important going on in these scenes. The thing that these two movies and these two scenes understand is that the man in Spider-Man is much more important than the spider. What I mean by that is that Peter Parker is what separates Spider-Man from the rest of the superheroes. Because Peter Parker is undeniably human. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm going to play a short clip from Kill Bill Volume 2. Batman is actually Bruce Wayne. Spider-Man is actually Peter Parker. He has to put on a costume to become Spider-Man. It is in that characteristic Superman stands alone. Superman didn't become Superman. Superman was born Superman. While I think the scene mischaracterizes Superman a bit here, it does a good job at setting up my next point. If this exact scene were played out by any other hero, how do you think it would go? Superman would lift the car back onto the bridge without any problem. Same could be said for Wonder Woman or Thor. Batman might approach it in much of the same way as Spider-Man, but he'd more than likely just take the kid out without talking to him. But Spider-Man does something I'm not sure any other superhero would do. He takes his mask off. Because Spider-Man, even with all his powers, is still human. And when I think about all this, and I think about the new Spider-Man, it just feels wrong. This Spider-Man doesn't have money problems. This Spider-Man doesn't have to face the consequences of his actions. At least not like this or this. This Spider-Man doesn't even mention Uncle Ben. The most important factor of Spider-Man becoming who he is. That one fatal mistake in those six very important words. These are the years when a man changes into the man he's going to become the rest of his life. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. And I get it, Uncle Ben has died so many times it's getting near on Batman's parents level. But that doesn't mean you should never mention him, and it definitely doesn't mean that you should replace him. Throughout the course of making this video, I realized why it felt so weird watching this movie in the theaters. Because I came to watch a Spider-Man movie, but this is not a Spider-Man movie. This is a character that fits into the MCU archetype. And if that's what they were going for, then fine, I get it, it's obviously successful. But the reason that I personally like Spider-Man is not because of the costumes or the powers, but because he stands out. He stands out because of how normal he is, how human, he's relatable. But this Spider-Man, the MCU Spider-Man, he doesn't stand out at all. And this character, hell, this whole cinematic universe is worse off because of it. What constitutes a hero? I guess a guy who just does good things and is willing to take chances to help Your other people. Good, right? He only wants to help. But not 100% good, because then he's an unrealistic hero. That man was...